just so we can give people a minute or two extra if you're okay with that, John Paul. Sure. Would you like to commence, Jean-Claude, or should we get started? Okay, we've got about 30 people so far, so probably a good time to start anyway. Okay. All right, so launching into it. Um, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are in the US. Uh, my name is Jean-Claude Worms. I am the Executive Director of COSPAR, the Committee on Space Research. So welcome to this uh, webinar organized for the American uh, region. It's aimed at informing the science communities and other uh, stakeholders uh, in the American region about a Coast Power activity dealing with small satellites for space science. Uh, in 2019, Coast Power has created a new task group uh, to explore the possibility of uh, assembling an international consortium to, that will develop, uh, launch, and acquire data from such a constellation of uh, small satellites. And as background, uh, we can refer to uh, our strategic plan for 2019, where such an activity was strongly recommended, but also to our uh, recent roadmap on small spacecraft utilization uh, that is based on a study that we started in 2017 and that was published in 2019. And the chair of that study group, uh, Robin Millen, will uh, later talk about uh, this activity amongst other things. Mm -hmm. By, um, by undertaking this task, COSPAR really aims at performing a worthwhile service uh, to the space community and the nations of the world, also in terms of capacity building amongst countries and institutions and maybe private sector that uh, pre presently have little space involvement or no space involvement and no experience. So that COSPAR team, uh, known formally as the task group on establishing the constellation of small satellites, uh, uh, TGCSS, otherwise known as TGCSS, uh, began its work in early March of this year, immediately, almost immediately after the confinement due to COVID-19. And uh, the chair and, the mem and some members of the task group will, uh, during this webinar, provide a briefing about the activity that uh, they have conducted so far. Uh, besides that, there's an article that highlights the work that's been done so far by the task group uh, that's been published in the August issue of Space Research Today, the Information Bulletin of COSPAR, an article by Dan Baker and the task group members, which you might also wish to refer to. So during these months, we've been polling various national bodies, members of COSPAR worldwide and other interested, potentially interested entities. And we have uh, started to gather a significant number of expressions of interest for our initiative. And you can find 
Uh, later on, uh, uh, at the end, we will have uh, the URL where you can uh, look at this, uh, the details of this activity and you can find also uh, this list of expressions of interest that's posted there. So now the ensuing discussion uh, will address what are the elements that these uh, national bodies, uh, nations, entities, space agencies, private sector firms, etc., might wish to offer as support and on ideas as, as to uh, what the various parties might do to help support the proposed small satellite infrastructure. Our role here, COSPAR's role, is to really to uh, act as a honest broker, so facilitating the process, establishing, for instance, scientific priorities for the first constellation or the constellations of satellites, and generally acting as, as an independent interface uh, between the various stakeholders. Uh, the, um, the funding for the activity uh, should come, of course, from these national bodies and other interested parties that have expressed interest in this activity. Now, following this first webinar for the American region, we'll have two other events, one for the Asian uh, regions. I, I know that we have some Asian colleagues listening in today. This will take place on the 29th of September uh, at 9.30 a.m. Beijing time, so GMT plus eight. And then one for the European, uh, African, and Middle East regions uh, at a date that is yet to be determined, but will take place in October. I would like to, uh, to detail the format for this uh, webinar. We have three speakers whom I will uh, introduce shortly. Uh, they will detail the task group's uh, work through their presentations, and that will take place immediately after a video introduction by the president of COSPAR, Len Fisk. We then have a number of panelists who are task group members, and they will appear on video and will uh, intervene uh, during the oral discussion that ensues. And then we have the pleasure of hosting today uh, now over uh, 25, and we have, I think, uh, more to come, uh, uh, view only attendees. So welcome all, and thank you for listening in. And you will have the possibility to ask questions uh, and offer comments and suggestions at all time uh, during the presentation by using the Q&A functionality of the Zoom platform. So please do avail of this opportunity as of now. I will ask as moderator and attempt to filter and, and channel your questions uh, um, and, uh, and comments to the uh, uh, panelists and the speakers during the debate. The, the webinar should last uh, one and a half hour, so it will end at 11.30 uh, a.m. Mountain Time and or 1.30 p.m. East Coast. Now, without uh, undue delay, I have the pleasure of introducing the first speaker. So, Professor, uh, sorry, my, my mistake. First, we have the, uh, as I said, the video introduction by uh, COSPA President Lentfisk. So, Michelle, if you'd be so kind to launch the video. Michelle, there is no sound. We seem to have a, a problem. Of course, we tested that twice uh, beforehand and it worked perfectly, but now that this is real time, it chooses. Can you hear it now, John Claude? Yes, we do. Maybe you, you start at the beginning the again. Discussion at the Coast Bar um, Symposium on... Apologies. Thank you. I would like to welcome you from the safety of my home to this town hall meeting on science questions that can be addressed by a constellation of small satellites and to express my gratitude on behalf of Coast Bar for your participation and for the guidance you will provide on how to implement concretely the objectives of the Coast Bar Task Group on establishing a constellation of small satellites, or as we like to call it, TGCSS. Several events led to the establishment of the task group. During the roundtable discussion at the Coast Bar Symposium on Jeju Island in 2017, NASA Associate Administrator Thomas Zerbokin introduced the concept that Coast Park could help coordinate a constellation of small satellites provided by many nations, and by doing so would promote international cooperation and help spread space technology to many nations. The 
Coast Bar Roadmap on Small Satellites for Space Science, published in 2019, explicitly called for Coast Bar to help coordinate a constellation of small satellites. The strategic seminar held in December of 2018 to chart Coast Bar's future recommended the establishment of the task group and the TGCSS was highlighted in the strategic action plan the Coast Bar adopted in March of 2019. The task group for you and your participation in its activities is thus of considerable importance to Coast Bar. Moreover, it is my belief that the importance of a constellation of small satellites with satellites contributed by many nations transition, transcends the usual Coast Bar mission of promoting international cooperation and spreading space technology to many nations. It is in fact an effort that can contribute to world peace. Indeed, we live in a time of increased militarization of space. It's the dark side of our growing dependence on satellites. If there was ever a major conflict or even a threat of a conflict between nations that depend for their survival or their capability to wage war on their satellites in orbit, then these satellites would be the first to be attacked. Thus, as more nations have access to the cap to, and capabilities in space, militarization of space is underway. It is reasonable to assume that the same nations, these same nations are developing the capability to defend their space assets or if need be to retaliate. And there's no treaty to prevent this. The United Nations Outer Space Treaty of 1967 prohibits the placement of nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction in space. However, it does not prohibit conventional weapons, such as kinetic weapons or lasers that can destroy satellites. One way to help avoid conflict and confrontation in space is to have programs such as the Constellation of Small Satellites in which all spacefaring nations, big and small, contribute, thereby collectively claiming space as a global commons, a resource not owned by one nation, but crucial to the future of all humankind, a global commons in which every nation with relevant capabilities can conduct space research, all for peaceful purposes, a global commons where cooperation is encouraged competition is discouraged, and conflicts are forbidden. What you do here today, therefore, is important. The constellations of small satellites that you're helping to develop will promote the concept that all spacefaring nations have a vested interest in maintaining space as a peaceful domain. I wish you success in this important. Okay, so now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Daniel Baker, who is the chair of the task group on establishing a constellation of small satellites. He's director of the LASP laboratory uh, from the University of Colorado in Boulder, distinguished professor of planetary and space physics, astrophysics and planetary science and of physics at the University of Colorado. So then the ether is all yours. Thank you, Jean-Claude, and uh, I hope my screen will be visible shortly. So, yes, and thank you for um, those from the community who are joining us today. We'll have three panelists, myself, Robin Millen, Anna Malchandran, and our goal here is to look forward, not to look backward, but I, I would just like to note the important role quite some time ago now that Professor Fisk played when he was Associate Administrator of NASA. And this was really to, in a sense, go back to the future, go back to small spacecraft, to the power that small spacecraft had to educate and train the next generation of professionals, uh, also to accomplish important scientific goals, and to, uh, in general, um, speed up the process of acquiring answers to the pressing questions in space and earth science. Uh, it was my privilege to work uh, with and for 
Len Fisk as the first project scientist for NASA's Small Explorer Program. And here you see a sweep of some of those missions. You may be familiar with some of the acronyms, you may not. But for the first several, um, I was uh, pleased to be the project scientist. We also had the Uni University Explorer Program, the study program, and um, the uh, Snowy and CHIPS programs really showed what the possibilities were. So this is going back um, upwards of 30 years now. And uh, I think it's fair to say that we now see that small spacecraft have reached something of full flower that they are really uh, demonstrating in so many ways. And I think Rob and Millen will talk uh, more about that uh, impressive history and the growth in small spacecraft. But in this article published in uh, AGU EOS journal back in 2007, General Warden and I talked about the, the promise of small spacecraft. And I think that this is being borne out. And so what we're here today to talk to you about is more about how one of the premier international space organizations, COSPAR, can really play an important role to enable and to support uh, in a strategic way the use of small spacecraft. And Len talked about, and Robin will elaborate, but there was a COSPAR strategic plan that was published in 2019. As the words here say, uh, COSPAR uh, felt that it could and should demonstrate the um, value to the member nations and uh, organizations around the world to develop a, con a consortium that could support the constellation of small spacecraft. And it, could use, it was crucial that it importantly uh, provide uh, scientific data of, uh, to solve crucial problems and that it would be uh, perhaps a, a very useful thing as a first step not by no means uh, the only thing, but to undertake one that would uh, focus on space weather and space weather forecasting. Uh, as was noted uh, briefly by Alain and Jean-Claude, a task group uh, was established. Um, I was uh, asked and was pleased to accept the responsibility of chairing this task group. And we have representatives from uh, around the world, many nations, as you see represented here. And uh, these are all individuals who have played uh, very important roles in one way or another in the use and the application of small spacecraft to important science problems. The ones highlighted in red again today have been active in the American sector, the Western Hemisphere, and uh, will be uh, featured on the panel today, and there will be future town halls featuring others of the task group members. Initially, um, as I think Jean-Claude noted, we uh, really got um, organized and, and uh, began our work in March of 2020. Um, we wanted to focus on several things, questions about what might be the small uh, spacecraft designs, whether there might be bus standards or not, uh, how to get these um, space vehicles into orbit, into uh, Earth orbit or wherever they were going to go, to focus on um, sort of common approaches on ground systems and communication that might be helpful to enable such a constellation, and of course, ultimately to make sure that the data were archived and shared and uh, were accessible to the broader scientific community. And all of these things were on our minds as we've uh, worked now over the past several months as a task group. There were many points of consensus that developed uh, with the task group pretty quickly. We certainly endorsed the idea that um, Coast Bar should be the honest broker, recognizing that Coast Bar did not have the resources to uh, financially support all of this, but it could still play a very crucial enabling role. We also felt that the constellation should very much take a grassroots approach, not a top-down approach, but a bottom-up approach, and really encourage all comers, whatever their capability and whatever uh, they would like to contribute, that this should be sort of the modus operandi for this uh, Coast Bar sponsored effort. We really felt that defining a, a structure and a framework was important, that we could certainly help 
that Coast Bar could help solicit contributions and could uh, seek support for launching and for the data efforts that I mentioned before. So all of these things were clearly uh, and rapidly agreed to by the uh, very diverse steering group, um, the task group members. There were two aspects of the action plan that, uh, that we have emphasized and, uh, that, and you, uh, those of you who have seen the article that appeared in Space Research Today for Coast Bar, see this, that one branch of the activity should really be geared toward harnessing the power of the current worldwide revolution in small sat capabilities that I mentioned. This is an unprecedented time for um, utilization of small spacecraft of all sorts. And um, the Coast Bar efforts should recognize that and really harness that power. But the second part, which is a very crucial one and we want to emphasize in our discussions today, is that the constellation uh, should be uh, geared also toward building capacity amongst nations and institutions that presently have little or no space involvement. And so uh, having the more experienced uh, parts of the small spacecraft world working with those who want to be players in that arena is a crucial aspect. So I'm not going to talk too much longer here. I want to uh, reiterate uh, some of the things that John claude said that a very important part of our reason for having a town hall a webinar here today is to share some of our thinking about what this constellation might be. But we also want to build much more of the grassroots kind of interest in this Coast Park program. We want to take advantage of things that are happening and make new things happen. We want to really solicit ideas from folks like you and people that you work with out in the community. And we want to engage especially new institutions and new researchers in the exciting realm of uh, space science, earth science, things that small sats can enable. And we want to answer your questions. And with that, I would like to now turn it over to Robin Millen, who will talk uh, more about her experience in the um, prior um, Coast Bar activities and, and what got us to this point in time. Robin, please take it away. Okay. <clears throat> I was going to briefly introduce Robin. Uh, to, um, she co-chaired the, uh, the Coast Bar Roadmap on Small Satellite that I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, so Dr. Millen is Margaret Annan Edward Lead Professor of Physics at Dartmouth College. Uh, her research includes the use of high altitude scientific balloon experiments and CubeSats to study Earth's uh, radiational belt. Thank you very much. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so as Dan said, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the roadmap that we worked on for small satellites uh, for space science. And as was mentioned previously, the, the paper, uh, the full report is published in Advances in Space Research. Um, so the study was done by an international uh, team under the auspices of Coast Bar and involved uh, both scientists, uh, policy experts, um, engineers, um, in the, that have worked on small satellites. And our focus was really on a range of small satellites, anything less than 300 kilograms or so. But um, we did pay special attention to CubeSats and CubeSat technology enabled small satellites. In other words, um, looking at what this boom in small satellites, um, particularly in the commercial sector, uh, how science can take advantage of that. And space science includes all the scientific disciplines covered by Coast Bar, also uh, including earth sciences uh, done from space. So our charter was to look at the status and scientific potential of small sats, the role that government agencies and industry can play, uh, policy considerations and obstacles um, in some cases, and finally, how can we foster international collaborations? So the, um, our work built on some of the previous work uh, that was done, including a National Academy of Science report, Achieving Science with CubeSats. Shortly, or actually as part of that, an ISI forum, an international forum was held on a science that could be done with CubeSats. And finally, there was an IDA report called Global Trends in Small Satellites that focused on small satellites more generally, uh, but we did um, use this as a resource. So the first part of the report looks at the current status and some of the near-term scientific potential of small satellites. We, we discussed some of the history that also Dan just alluded to, um, but also point out the rapid increase in the number of small satellites being launched 
um, in which you can see from this plot. Of course, um, many of these have been launched in the United States, but we see an increasing number of players from around the world who are participating in this. And we discuss some of the, the very near-term science, science that's in current development and that can be achieved. In the second part of the report, we, we discuss more far-reaching visions for how small satellites can be used for science. And these were meant to just be illustrations of some ideas that could be used, but we really felt that the, the actual science objectives should really come from the scientific community. But some of the examples we gave are a large constellation for Earth observation, and this one is actually within reach. We see lots of commercial uh, satellites being launched um, in these mega constellations. Um, a swarm exploration of a solar system body is another example where maybe each small satellite would have a different role and you could have them crashing into um, or, or getting very close to, uh, to solar system bodies. Um, then looking perhaps further in the future, something like a synthetic aperture telescope. James Webb is, is kind of reaching the limits of what we can launch as a single telescope in the, the launch vehicles we have today. So maybe in the future we need to consider um, multiple satellites that would be working together for a synthetic aperture telescope. This is really challenging in the optical and infrared. And so we discussed that in the report. And then finally, in interstellar mission, which of course a small satellite, um, the kind of acceleration you need to get, um, you really need to have small satellites to, to achieve that. So part three of the report, we look at some of the obstacles and the means for overcoming those, um, including funding and, and policies and the critical role that government agencies and industry can play in helping us navigate through those obstacles. We also discuss at length some of the partnerships um, and we highlight in particular the QB50 project, which many of you are probably familiar with. And this was more of an educational, um, meant as an educational project, but the model that QB50 used for bringing together different nations, each nation uh, contributing one or more satellites was something that we really felt could be done as for science missions as well. And in particular, QB50 also illustrated the capacity building um, power of such a thing. There were a number of countries who, who provided their very first satellite through that effort. We talk about fostering international collaborations uh, between universities, between universities and industry, and sharing lessons learned. And finally, the impact this could have on secondary education and workforce development. So the report makes five recommendations, one to the science community, one to space industry, one to the space agencies, one to policymakers, and finally one to COSPAR. And the last one is the one we're really focusing on here today that COSPAR should facilitate a process whereby international teams can come together um, to address science goals and uh, through a QB50 modular or QB50 like modular uh, small satellite constellation. And the role of COSPAR as has been mentioned would really be a, a one of coordinating, uh, not funding, but helping to um, work on some of the infrastructure as Dan mentioned, data, launch opportunities, radio licensing, you know, help navigate all of those things and bring scientists together for, um, for science, defining the science requirements for such a mission. So our task force has focused on a first mission that would focus on space weather, but we view this as really only a beginning, that um, this particular uh, science topic really leverages some of the existing international efforts, and you're going to hear them all talk about uh, one of those in a moment. Uh, but the idea here is that this would be this first mission would be a proof of concept or a pilot project to, to really develop that framework that we would hope would then be used for other science objectives in all areas of space science. And so future events um, at Coast Bar and uh, the Coast Bar upcoming meeting and other venues are going to be really critical for getting community participation and in, in defining these constellation missions of the future. Um, so we're this town hall, we're really trying to get folks interested in participating in in defining what those look like. And hopefully um, this is really a path forward for multiple different constellations that we, we uh, hope will happen in the future for all kinds of different science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, so the next and, and final speaker is Dr. Amal Chandran, who is the vice uh, chair of TGCSS. Dr. Chandran is assistant professor of the school at the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He's Director for Space Technology at the Satellite Research Center there, where he's developing new satellite missions and a space application center for training space scientists and engineers. 
Thank you, Jean-Claude. Um, hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce a program that we call INSPIRE, or the International Satellite Program in Research and Education that was founded about three years ago and has now grown to uh, a number of missions. Um, uh, so I want to introduce this paradigm for international space cooperation in developing small science satellites um, and as a, as, a, as a model for capacity building as well as developing uh, space science missions with uh, international collaboration. Uh, Coast Park, a body like Coast Park can uh, really, uh, you know, enhance the development and, um, and, and facilitate uh, more such missions, in my opinion. So um, what you see here are the different missions that are being, uh, that are in various stages of being built. Uh, we have seven of these and the flags on top of each one of these represents the countries that are uh, involved in the development of these missions. Um, so INSPIRE INSPIRE started in 2017. Uh, it was an initiative between the University of Colorado at Boulder and the Indian Institute of Science and Technology uh, and in India and National Central University of Taiwan. Um, so we decided to build a, a CubeSat. It was at that time decided to be a 3U CubeSat. It has since grown to be a 9U. We've had some mission creep in there. Uh, but uh, we, we decided that this would be a really good platform for uh, training students in space technologies. Um, Mal, can, can I quickly interrupt? I, I think you're sharing, you may have multiple screen oh. and you're sharing the screen that has, you know, the two slides, the one, well, exactly, that's, that's, that's better. Uh, okay. If you could make full screen on this one because it's, it's fairly small. Is that fine? Um, no, but okay. If you if you cannot do better than that, that's fine. Let's let's have it. Is this okay? I think that's presenter mode, Amal. Yeah. Okay. That's the presenter mode. You it's probably uh, because you're sharing one of the screens that has the presenter mode while the full screen is on another the full mode is on another screen. Oh, I only have one screen now. Uh, okay, so I don't know why this is the one sharing. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry for the interruption. Sure. Um yeah, so since then uh, it has grown to 11 universities in 10 countries and we have, uh, we have a number of industry partners as well. We presented this idea as many conferences and uh, universities that wanted to uh, join in and had instruments or missions uh, approach this and it, and it grew. Um, what we have right now, we have uh, two satellites that, are, that we have built uh, and tested and are getting ready for launch uh, by the end of the year. InspireSat-1 is flying a uh, ionospheric instrument called the Compact Ionosphere Probe that has been funded by the National Space Organization of Taiwan. And it also has a dual aperture miniature X-ray spectrometer that is um, uh, a follow-up from the MINX mission funded by NASA. Uh, so both the instruments have been integrated. The satellite has undergone full testing and is awaiting launch and delivery post uh, you know, COVID when travel resumes. Uh, the satellite is a 9U roughly. Uh, it's 30 by 20 by 15 centimeters and a ring deployed satellite. Uh, INSPIRE 2 is mainly funded by the National Space Organization of Taiwan and it's a 3U satellite and has been built at the National Central University in Taiwan and scheduled for a December launch. Um, INSPIRE 3 uh, flies three instruments, a UV instrument for thermosphere occultation built at uh, LASP, a digital flux gate magnetometer from the University of Canada, um, for University of Alberta, and a spatial heterodyne interferometer from uh, Germany, University of Wuppertal in Germany. Um, the, the LASP instrument is under a pre-phase A study. The rest of the instruments in the spacecraft has been fully funded from uh, contributors from agencies in Canada, Germany, and Singapore. Um, and uh, we're expected to build and launch in 2023. INSPIRE 4 is funded by Singapore, and the launch is from uh, an ISRO PSLV, the Indian Space Research Organization's Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle that has been procured by uh, Singapore. And it has a number of instruments, including the ionosphere probe, an imager, electric propulsion thruster, and um, a spatial heterodyne interferometer for- General, can you advance your slides, please? Yeah. Are you seeing- no, we're, we're still seeing uh, the current Inspire partners as the primary slide. Oh, sorry. Apologies about that, Dan. It's okay. So are you seeing the- Inspire? That's better. That's, that's better. Uh, if you can go to full screen on that or something, that'd be great. Okay. 
So uh, this is the Inspire One slide. Um, you know, hopefully you can see this now. Um, so as I mentioned, Inspire One has been completely built one and two, and is undergoing uh, and has completed testing and is awaiting delivery post COVID. Um, so Inspire One is on a polar satellite launch vehicle from the Indian Space Research Organization, scheduled for a December launch, while Inspire Two is on a Falcon X launch uh, in December as well. Uh, Inspire 3 and 4 are again in various stages of being built um, and uh, both are on an ISRO PSLV but has been funded via different mechanisms in different countries. And these are uh, 27U satellites again ring deployed and about 20 kilograms in size. Uh, Inspire 5 is a 1U. Uh, it has been built by University of Versailles in France, and uh, it is planned for a December 2020 on a Falcon X launch as well. Uh, so there is a very high, high likelihood that Inspire 2 and 5 might launch before Inspire 1, but you know, we've named the missions in the order that they were uh, funded and, and started working on. Uh, Inspire 6 will do GPS, uh, radio occultation, and reflectometry, and also carry an atmosphere probe and a hyperspectral imager. It's a 12U satellite funded primarily from Taiwan and is in a pre-phase A study at the moment. So as you can see from these uh, seven, uh, six to seven satellites, um, the, the, the satellites range from 1U to 27U, uh, and we have pod deployed uh, CubeSats as well as ring deployed satellites. So one of the main considerations while developing the bus was that we want it to be scalable. Um, and we have used the same kind of e electronic power system and uh, onboard computer flight software structures, which have uh, this, the same uh, background from the Inspire One program. Uh, an important consider consideration has been the scalability for these subsystems to be compatible with the CubeSat COM factor, um, as well as for ring deployment from launch vehicles. Um, some, one of the things that we've had to do is to handle export authorization. Um, so we've extensively used the education exclusion and the fundamental research exclusions uh, between the institutes of higher learning. Um, and uh, you know, so we've com we completed an extensive review of export protocols. And uh, if anyone is interested, please get in touch with us. Um, and at the University of Colorado, we'll be happy to uh, let you know how we have handled the export protocols for these. Uh, any third party uh, proprietary and export controlled information like the ADCS that is provided to us is black boxed. We've also worked with providers like Blue Canyon and uh, helped them to export ADCS systems directly to one in Singapore for some of the missions. Uh, the spacecraft bus, uh, we have a 12U configuration um, or a 9U or 12U configuration that ranges up to 15 uh, kilograms. The spacecraft details are here. And as you can see, it's a you know, very competitive in price um, bus that we have developed through the international partners. And we have a 27U configuration as well that goes up to X-band. So we have anything ranging from UHF to X-band and uh, we believe that we have created a very capable bus through this international collaboration. Uh, the heart of the INSPIRE program is a 10-week summer, summer program where the students from all the different universities come together to the University of Colorado, and we have a very intensive hands-on spacecraft development activity that happens. Uh, the advisors also come, and uh, it's, a, it's a boot camp for uh, space students. So we have both engineers and scientists working together. Um, and the spacecrafts are mostly developed and tested through this program over three to four years. Uh, it's been a very transformative learning experience, understanding international you know, differences in culture and having students work together. At the best of times, it's a challenging job. Having uh, international students work together has been extremely challenging but rewarding. Um, so what we intend to do with COSPAR is to have a partnership on capacity building where COSPAR will select a number of students and send them and uh, embed them with the INSPIRE program at uh, the University of Colorado from 2021. Uh, the students uh, will participate in preliminary design, uh, hardware prototyping, flight hardware development, testing and integration, as well as mission operations. Uh, we have a COSPAR small satellite symposium happening in Singapore from November 15 to 19. And prior to the COSPAR symposium, there will be a one week capacity building, capacity building program um, that will be arranged at the Satellite Research Center at uh, Nanyang Technological University. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we look forward to welcoming all of you at the, uh, the Space Science with Small Satellite Symposium uh, scheduled for 15 to 19 November. Hopefully uh, travel restrictions would have been lifted and uh, we would be able to have a full on-site meeting at that time. 
So. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Amal. Um, so thank you once more to all three speakers for your presentations. Uh, I am starting to receive some uh, some questions uh, and remarks. Uh, while they, they keep uh, arriving, I would like to ask whether any of the, the three uh, panelists uh, would like to make some additional remarks and comments at this point. Meanwhile, please, all the attendees, you can start shooting at us your questions. Well, um, I might just say that uh, uh, I hope that those listening uh, understand that um, the people who have been involved in small sat research, whether it's uh, research in engineering and how to build things or how to educate the next generation or for the science, really are very uh, excited, very eager to share that that knowledge and experience, and I think Inspire is a, a great illustration of that kind of thing. So uh, we hope that those who are listening who want to, uh, so to speak, earn a seat at the international table in space science uh, really understand that this program that COSPAR is envisioning would really be an opportunity to share experience amongst more seasoned performers as well as those who are just learning. Uh, the first question I, I had, thank you, Dan. And the first question I had uh, from Charles Norton is uh, is related to Amal's presentation. I think is uh, uh, how were the mission collaborations established, and were there any specific challenges to working in, in, internationally? Great question. Uh, so the first mission came about because we were invited by the Indian Space Research Organization and the Indian Institute of Science and Technology to talk about. Uh, the University of Colorado's experience uh, in building CubeSats with student participation, especially the Colorado Student Space Weather Experiment and the MINX mission. Uh, so we we talked about these experiences, how, you know, I was one of the first students uh, in, in the CSSWE um, cohort. Uh, and when we, we, we talked about those missions, they said, we have a long, a, we have a lot of excess launch capacity on our PSLV missions. And if you have an instrument, we'd be happy to develop a spacecraft and put it together. So that was the idea for Inspire, where you know, somebody was offering a launch and, and then we had one of our spare instruments and we decided uh, let's go ahead and put a program together for teaching primarily, uh, teaching and training. Um, and from there, you know, uh, Lauren Chang at the universe, National Central University in Taiwan, uh, quickly got on board with the idea and invited us and wanted to be on board. Uh, we've, we have, uh, so that's, that's how Inspire One was born. And then we presented this at many different conferences and universities that had the funding already to develop instruments came and asked if uh, you know, we could uh, contribute or, or, or put the program together. So many a times it was uh, this disaggregated model came about because there was universities that had funding for an instrument or subsystems or spacecraft, but not funding for the whole mission or, or for procuring launch. So we, we've played the role of a facilitator in bringing together these different entities and that's how the missions came about. The second part of the question in addressing challenges in building satellites yeah, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's always a challenge building it within the same university. It's been a very big challenge. There has been miscommunication, but as many people are finding out, we embraced Slack about in 2017. Um, and uh, we, we've always been having Zoom meetings since then. So, uh, so I guess we were ahead of the curve in that way uh, in, in structuring groups. Uh, but most of the work gets done in the summer when everybody is, um, you know, at one facility and, and we have, uh, and the team gets to meet each other and, and address a lot of outstanding questions. But after that, once they go back to the home institutions, we try and uh, have them work individually. We have a vertical structure where there is a P institutional PI and subsystem leads at each of the universities. And we maintain the communication channels as best as we can. Okay, Mal, could you, I know we've, Robin? I was just going to ask them all because I know we've discussed the issue of ITAR and maybe you could say a few words about how you um, keep everything open source and. Right. Uh, so we've, we try to keep things using the educational and the fundamental research exemption licenses. Uh, this means that um, most of the hardware or the technical uh, details have to be uh, open source or publish, publishable. 
So we try to, we have an Inspire website and we, uh, we share most of the technical details over on that website. And we also, you know, in our papers, we, uh, we, we share details on the architecture and, and the hardware as well. So we, you know, it's, uh, it, it's all in the open domain. And, uh, you know, when you publish, you have to, using the FAIR data, policy, you have to make sure that that data is also publicly available. So as long as it's for technical and educational fundamental research purposes, you are able to do that. Uh, again, you know, any proprietary um, hardware that we get from vendors are black boxed, uh, meaning, you know, it, it is only with the university that has done the procurement and they handle all the interfacing to it. Uh, it has made for some awkward uh, situations where somebody writing flight software if they want to know an ADCS command, has to go through a different university <laughs> and, 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 and get those commands. Uh, but that's how we have essentially done it. And uh, in the slides, I have given the um, the license numbers and the, uh, it, you know, so hopefully these slides are available for folks. And uh, if, you have, if they have questions, they can reach out to me. I can. Okay, thank you. Dan, you want to add something to that? No, I think I think they've answered the question very well, and uh, I believe that um, um, there are, are undoubtedly going to be different challenges in the future. But many of these things have been um, ironed out, you might say, through some of the programs that are already underway, Inspire, and other programs that the task group is familiar with. Okay, I've got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, one that I will launch at you in a, in a minute. Uh, there's one that is really aimed at, at COSPA, so I might as well answer that. It's from Gib. What is or might be the connection between this COSPA initiative and other similar initiatives such as uh, UN USA's Space Access for All? Uh, so uh, as you know, Dan mentioned that at the beginning, this is basically a starting activity for us. So uh, we have not uh, engaged in uh, anything other than probing the interest of a, of a number of uh, countries and, and entities, but this is a, a very good question. Uh, COSPA does have a uh, memorandum of understanding with uh, COPIOS uh, on the issue, especially on the issue of planetary protection planetary protection policy, which is, as you know, one, one strong activity of COSPAR as well. And so it would be actually one of the topics that I want to continue discussing uh, with a number of people at COPIOS, in, in particular, for instance, Nicholas Hedman uh, uh, and other colleagues. Uh, this one might, might come on the table as well as what we can do to basically coordinate the approaches here. Uh, the other one being uh, space debris, but uh, this is uh, this is a good point that I will uh, I will uh, follow up with. I guess uh, uh, I would say that I have no authority to speak on policy matters for COSPAR, but I would I would uh, say that what we as a task group have presumed is that COSPAR is going to work with uh, all uh, interested entities and partners and organizations. And it's going to try to make all these things work more smoothly, more effectively, and um, is, is seeking to fill whatever niches there might be or whatever gaps there might be in order to make it more possible for the world to have a much more effective small satellite kind of effort, uh, broadly speaking. Would you agree with that? Okay. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you and I talked about COSPAR acting as a, as a, as an honest broker, a go between, uh, of course, using the expertise of our scientific commissions, panels, and associate to basically fuel the, the corresponding debate uh, yeah. and helping to establish science priorities for these constellations. But indeed, COSPAR uh, uh, will use its institutional and, and, and also private sector network, we're starting to have one, to gather the necessary support, uh, financial and in-kind for this activity, but also to generate uh, you know, coordination of existing activities and, and uh, uh, collaboration. But we don't want to reinvent the, the CubeSat, as it were. <laughs> And I, can I just add also, I mean, we, we, I think this was also in the spirit of our report was we want to, to understand how to better coordinate with and leverage some of the existing things yeah. going on in small satellites more generally. But of course, our emphasis is on science uh, as well. And so I think that, you know, this is, um, there are other efforts like, like going on, like the Inspire program, but 
but trying to bring together scientists in a more um, cohesive effort that we can do more if we work together, I think is the, the idea here. And then partnering with all those other, whether it's industry or that are also advancing small satellites. And facilitating cooperation has been COSPAR's hallmark since its inception uh, 60 years ago. Okay, I've got another question, which is a, a, a biggie as well. Uh, how, do you, how do we foresee industry, uh, especially the large nano satellite constellation operators participating possibly in this, in this initiative? Over I to you. First, <laughs> that, that I'd, I'd welcome the other panelists to speak as well, but I, I could see two or three different ways. Um, one is I could imagine, um, although this may not always be the case, but that some of the constellation operators might have some excess capacity uh, where a small instrument might, uh, might be able to fly on there so that, um, so that there could be a, a cooperation in that sense. Uh, there might also, as I'll talk about, there might be excess capacity so that uh, some of the spacecraft or some of the missions we're envisioning um, COSPAR being involved in might be able to get a ride into space through such a, a constellation effort. And, uh, you know, I, I also think that uh, it's quite conceivable to me that emerging from some of the scientific investigation that Robin just talked about, that there might be new kinds of measurements that prove themselves to be so valuable that there might be a, a whole new constellation that might be put together to make a new set of measurements that would be advantageous, whether it's for space weather or other earth observing or uh, whatever it might be. So, so uh, I think uh, at least I've been envisioning through the task group's effort that we would really be interested in talking to the constellation operators and to others in industry to see how this, um, the work that we're envisioning for the science of COSPAR might eventually be applied for much more um, business or uh, operational needs. Uh, I don't know, uh, Robin or Mal, if you have other things you'd suggest. Yeah, I, I think Starlink has already been in discussion, SpaceX in, uh, with uh, NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center about providing drag information from there. Uh, many satellites already up in orbit, you know, once they have about 30 or 40,000 satellites, I think, <laughs> just that drag information or in situ measurements for of plasma or, or some kind of as a small sensor from that would be immensely useful to the community. Uh, if we can, uh, you know, discuss with these large constellation now operators about uh, yeah, hosting payloads, that, that would be a very good uh, addition to the task group charter. I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, and I'll just add two other aspects. I mean, one of them is, I think, by partnering, certainly from our standpoint, by partnering with industry, we hopefully can learn how to do this and, and build things more cheaply, which we haven't yet. I mean, I think we're doing that with CubeSats, but I mean, if you think about NASA, for example, it's um, how do we build these constellations of hundreds to thousands of satellites? So I think industry can, can teach us about the manufacturing process. But also, hopefully, there's a benefit for industry as well, because, you know, their workforce presumably comes from the universities that and, and research labs. I mean, we're training the next generation of engineers uh, that will work in industry. And so one hopes that they would be also amenable to working with us um, and, and through internships and so forth. Mm -hmm. On this issue, my my own limited experience uh, uh, dealing with uh, with not well planetary protection to start with. Uh, this is something that we uh, we have uh, thought about, of course, and uh, we've got some uh, uh, let's say support or or uh, a good spirit of collaboration from uh, a couple of uh, private uh, companies, uh, namely Blue Origin and and SpaceX, who both participated to our, um, to our panel meeting, uh, I think it was last December or last January. And so there was, uh, there was the spirit of, uh, of cooperation. Now, of course, obviously, they, they've got their own agenda. This is uh, something that is, uh, that is obvious. For instance, if you look at the issue of the light pollution from uh, constell large constellations of satellites uh, that is posing some problems to astronomers, uh, ground-based astronomers, 
And uh, again, my experience here has been that, for instance, SpaceX has been very cooperative in participating to the uh, uh, um, IAU work group on this issue. And so, uh, of course, they will not uh, renounce their, their objectives, but they're willing to, to, to participate uh, and to collaborate with scientists, I guess, up to a point. Um, we have, if this issue is, uh, is exhausted from the panelists, we have a question about the timeline for this, uh, for this effort and how is our group uh, planning to engage with countries and institutions and companies who are not yet aware of the initiative to, to gather the, uh, the support. Uh, now, of course, uh, the way we've done that so far, uh, COSPAR has basically written to all its national uh, members and, uh, and international uh, member unions. Uh, asking that they disseminate the information to their various uh, research lab, universities, uh, potentially private companies uh, interested in their countries. And so we were uh, hopeful that uh, this would disseminate slowly into, into the, the landscape. And this has been the case up to a point. Uh, certainly the people uh, listening in uh, can also be vessels for this uh, dissemination. Uh, the timeline is uh, a bit open-ended yet, uh, but uh, we basically also want to engage the major space agencies. There are talks ongoing with NASA uh, that uh, Mal and Dan can, can talk about. Uh, there are talks ongoing with ESA, uh, obviously China, uh, India. So this is something that we want to, uh, to broaden. Dan, I, I think you, you might want to comment on that one. I'd be happy to, and thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I, I think um, what we want to say is that I think the time for talking is uh, should be over and time for action should be um, should now be underway. And um, and so our we as a task group, I, I think regard the town halls, the webinars that we're, we're uh, having as a very much a part of our activity to gather information and to develop ideas. But what we want to do is to see our task group, in a sense, evolve into something different, which is probably a steering group or so. Uh, this is up to COSPAR how it handles this. But by the end of this calendar year, by the time of the, uh, the Australia COSPAR meeting, uh, we really believe that we should evolve to a new stage of phase two, which is that there now be groups that really start to undertake uh, genuine action that really start to carry out programs that uh, more coordination of the existing activities, yes, but also development and opportunities for new people to get engaged and to start uh, designing, building, and testing the kind of small spacecraft we're talking about. So the timeline for this, I think, is uh, that we should, uh, time's a wasting here, that we should really get moving on uh, a higher degree of coordination for existing programs, but also uh, letting new players, new countries, new institutions, and indeed new uh, companies that want to be part of this to really start uh, um, actively doing that instead of uh, all of us just talking about the possibilities. Let's start getting into the, the real meat of this and really get going. And I'd uh, defer to Robin and Amal to talk more about that as well. One thing you, want, you might want to inject into your answer is, is the, another question is how will this uh, COSPAR constellation or constellations cooperate with other existing programs to form a larger constellation and, and uh, INSPIRE is, is exemplified here. Yeah, well, we th I think Mal can speak to this certainly, but we, I think we think of INSPIRE as in its own way as a, as a pilot activity and one that, uh, that uh, I think uh, Inspire would be delighted to uh, to lay its experiences on the table as part of the effort, right, Omar? Yeah, Dan, I, I think um, at the stage of the task group, we are soliciting uh, community opinion via these town halls and reaching out through various platforms, such as, you know, the article that we have published in uh, COSPAR Journal, for example. Um, so we, we want to solicit opinions from the community about what can be the, uh, the science objectives of the constellation, the first constellation, and we hope to have an answer and, and formulate those science objectives 
by the end of the year and and hopefully have that presented at the COSPAR um, meeting in, in, in Australia. And, uh, you know, uh, once we have the science objectives identified, we'll address technical details such as how many satellites and how many orbital planes do we need to address these objectives. Again, we want to emphasize that we want to have a bottoms up approach. Uh, the task group is only going to define initially the science objectives, uh, but we will have at its resource for participating entities, um, you know, best practices learned from programs like Inspire on how to manage these projects if you know the, the participating institutes want such uh, expertise but we're not going to be defining uh, you have the architecture for the satellites or the instruments or, or any of any of those any of those right. items. Yeah. Um, then uh, on the other question of um, working with entities like COSPA, of, like Inspire, uh, we would have Inspire as a platform for uh, capacity building. Uh, we would also have Inspire for, as a platform for satellite architecture, if people want to use that. Um, as, as far as collaborating scientifically on Inspire missions, Inspire is flying a, um, a ionospheric, uh, you know, plasma payload on four out of its six missions in multiple, uh, you know, on SSOs as well as mid inclination and equatorial orbit. So we'll, you know, it, in some ways it is a constellation, but you know, as you can see from the many different instruments, it's it's a combination of instruments that's been put together addressing many different questions. Uh, if the objectives of the task group and the constellations align with some of the instruments on board, yes, I think, uh, you know, that can become part of the constellation. Uh, we are also working on a data sharing plan uh, where, you know, uh, all the participating universities and the community will have access to the data for analysis as well. So. Um, That's good. You just answered the last question that came in about the, the data products. Uh, we said the constellation should, of course, be developed and launched, but it should also acquire data. And the question was about, is it, is it right to suppose that there will be a free and open data policy for the community? And this is something that we discussed quite a lot in our report as well about the importance of that. And, and in, um, even if, if we're buying data from from you know, commercial satellite constellations, for example, this is a really important thing. People often do science with data that was collected for other purposes. And so having it open really enables new science. Um, but I'll just elaborate. I think this is one of the areas that we can really do something now, which is to try to connect all of these Inspire, but also anybody else who is launching small satellites in a, um, collecting these kinds of ionospheric or space weather related data um, and try to bring those communities together and develop some kind of ground infrastructure, data infrastructure that would help with, with what you're talking about, Amal, and, and not just a data sharing plan, but can we actually, you know, should Coast Bar be trying to coordinate um, yeah. developing some of the infrastructure to, to get the data together in one place? Um, and we haven't worked out any of the details, but I think that's one of the areas where, where the community input can be really helpful is, is uh, what, and, and maybe that's a, for a good first step we can take. To further answer to your point. question, I would say that the, um, it's, I think the bedrock sentiment amongst the task group members to have free and open uh, access to data, but recognizing that many of the small satellite programs are done on a shoestring and that anything that Coast Park can do through its good offices to help ease the, um, the sharing and the uh, let's say the aggregation of data from these uh, many different kind of spacecraft would really be a great thing. And uh, Coast Bar has been very successful in those kinds of um, uh, activities in the past, I think it will be in the future. And another area that I think we have discussed, which maybe we could discuss a little more is in, in um, getting the data down in the first place is that, you know, something that distributed ground stations, connecting people, we could potentially get more data down if we did that, helped coordinate that. So there's existing infrastructure and I think just bringing people together to collaborate, maybe you could just achieve a lot in a low cost way just through that. I don't know, Amal, if you guys have talked about that at all or how you guys are doing the ground station 
Yeah, uh, we have, we have, uh, let me see, at last count, we have four or five universities uh, putting in ground stations. We have three S-band ground stations, one in Taiwan, one in Singapore, and one in um, what at uh, University of Colorado at last. Um, so we have three S-band, one X-band ground station, and uh, five UHF ground stations distributed across the globe. Um, we have, we're trying to standardize the telemetry back, you know, the, uh, the, the software that we use for downlinking the data, um, but we have not figured out how to apply for FCC license for, uh, you know, control and command and control from US for a Singaporean satellite yet. Uh, so I have had a couple of conversations with the FCC and I hope that it'll be a, a painless process and, and we would figure that out eventually. But right now the primary operator downlinks the, the data, the com uh, operates the satellite, but the data downlink can be over many satellites as long as, you know, the UHF data, if it is in the amateur band. Um, for S band, that's it's tricky because you know you need a, you need license for downlinking data on S or X. Um, but yes, to answer your question, we want to have a standardized ground station network running same type of software where the data is downlinked and put on a cloud server uh, that then all the participating universities have access to. So that's the plan that we are working towards. Um, and I think for the constellation for Cospar, we can also provide. Uh, details on how to put that ground station together, um, because again, that is all in the open source as well. Uh, so, you know, we can help with setting that up and setting it so that the data is uh, is on a common server platform. Okay, um, Amal, you mentioned uh, you mentioned capacity building a a again. I should I should point out that. Um, of course, I mean, using satellites to build up expertise in space areas is a very affordable way to uh, to help emerging space countries and, and students and early career scientists. And I want to, to mention that TGCSS has, is already working in relation with our other panel on capacity building. Uh, Dan has invited its chair, Carlos Gabriel, to one of our meetings. And so there is, uh, there is coordination here. So I, I thought it was, uh, it was useful to mention that. Absolutely. Um, I have not, I have not answered in, in detail using the Q and A box, but of course we've we've done that in sequence uh, live. So, uh, um, do we have more more questions coming from the audience? It seems not. Um, do we, Jean Claude? Do we have a way for people to submit? Uh, we're also looking for ideas from the community for areas that we should be focusing on or prioritizing. Do we have a way for people to submit comments or suggestions? Yes, uh, at the end, there will be a slide with various uh, contact points. Uh, there will, of course, people can, can be informed and, and uh, make sure that, uh, that they follow what's, uh, uh, what's being developed uh, on our website and specifically on the TGCSS uh, webpage. Uh, there's an address that will be shown later, email address where you can uh, uh, send queries, requests, but also uh, send us your input because as, as Robin mentioned, this is also about getting your suggestions and input for this uh, for the rest of this uh, activity. So uh, basically stay tuned for, for web and email feedback on, the, on these discussions and future initiatives and make sure that anything you want to forward to us is channeled through this, uh, through this email address. We'll, uh, we, can, we can think about other ways. We have not done so yet, but we could, for instance, establish a Slack channel uh, to uh, to share things uh, as well, and so this is something that uh, that we can easily set up in the next few days, um, and we'll, uh, so we'll I think make sure I, that you are made aware of that. On behalf of the task group, uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, we recognize that it may not be um, this may not have been the ideal time for everybody to tune in here, but for those of you in the within the sound of our voices. Uh, if you have colleagues or so who are interested or who might be interested, please direct them. I think now we're seeing on the on the website or on the uh, uh, view graph here um, some of the contact points. We'd be delighted to hear from people who couldn't participate in the in the webinar today. 
people with ideas, people who would like to make suggestions on how to how to do this better, how to go, how to move forward more effectively. But uh, we hope that in in very short order we can go from this kind of developing of an action plan to carrying out an action plan that will really uh, make uh, the science and the uh, education and training all better. And uh, that those that have been successful to a degree in all of these things so far can share their expertise and help, uh, help elevate the whole uh, community worldwide to, uh, to use small spacecraft more effectively for science and uh, not only for space weather, but for all of the discipline areas that Robin talked about. So with so, that, unless there are more questions or so, I'll turn it back to Jean-Claude for uh, any wrap -up. Right, I, I don't see, thanks Dan, I don't see any, any uh, pending questions uh, or comments. So uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll set up the right channel so that you can forward whatever suggestions you have for us. Uh, I'd like to thank you all very, very gratefully, the panelists, of course, but all the attendees who listened in and participated via their questions and comments. As I said, stay tuned for uh, web updates and then send us your feedback by email. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for attending and above all, uh, stay safe in this uh, crazy world. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>